weekend to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. How wonderful it is that he is alive. So in celebration of that, we're going to be taking a pause of our study of First Thessalonians, and we are going to be diving into Matthew 28 today and reading the resurrection account in that chapter. So let's go ahead and pray as we get started. God, we just come to you today and we are just in awe of you, Jesus, and what you have done for us on the cross and just all that your death and resurrection means for us. We thank you for redeeming us and reconciling us and making us right with God. And we love you so much. We pray that as we read these words, that you'll speak to our hearts and just so show us um, and transform us, um, whatever it is you want to show us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, we're going to be in Matthew 28 today, and we're going to take a look at the whole chapter. It's not very long, um, and we're going to read, we'll read it in sections, in three different sections, and I'm going to be reading out the NIV, and they do divide it into three different distinct sections. So we're going to read each one of them and talk about them. So let's go ahead and read uh, Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. I love to read the different resurrection accounts and to think about each one of them from the perspective of the women and what they were thinking and how they processed through all of these different emotions that they would have had going from watching Jesus die on the cross and be buried in the tomb, and then to go on that Sunday morning and be able to see the stone rolled away, to encounter this angel, this angel of the Lord, and just to think about the, just the span of emotions and experiences that they had in just a few days. So going from Thursday night to Sunday morning, what a range. And just the depths of despair and just horror watching. So we look back in in 27 um, at verse 61 where they're burying Jesus. And it says, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb as uh, Joseph of Arimathea um, put him in the tomb and, and rolled the stone in front of the entrance and then went away. And they were sitting there watching. And so they saw all of this happen. They had a front row seat and I can just imagine the grief that they were experiencing. And so then to show up early at dawn on that first day of the week and to experience this angel of the Lord appearing. It says they went to look at the tomb and then there was this violent earthquake. And so were the women there during the earthquake and then the the angel of the Lord coming down? Well, to me, the text reads that way. Um, but were they there? They definitely encountered the angel. So regardless of where they were when the earthquake happened, they definitely encountered this angel. And so this violent earthquake that happens and the angel of the Lord that comes down and his description is that he was like lightning. So very, I I envision this very shiny being, um, whose clothes were white as snow, the purest white that we could ever imagine. And this experience was so overwhelming that the guards were so afraid that they they shook. It says they became like dead men. So we can assume maybe they, they fainted. So they they just kind of missed this whole experience because they got so afraid. And so then we have the angel 
speaking to the women and saying what angels tend to always say when they show up, don't be afraid. And which I, I just love because I would imagine encountering an angel would be a little bit overwhelming. Um, and just think about the different angels and how they're described and yeah, very, a very shiny, maybe a little bit larger than life dude. Um, all of a sudden being somewhere where you weren't expecting to see a, a person or a creature of any type. Um, so do not be afraid. And then he gives them this good news that he's risen, just as he said, and he gives them a message to go and give to the disciples. And I think it's uh, one of the things that I think is very interesting here is that the women would have been considered um, like their witness would not have been in that time in the Roman world, their witness, their testimony would not have been considered valid. Um, it would have been, um, they were the, what the word of a woman was considered to be not trustworthy, um, and not, um, as reliable as say guards. Um, and I just think it's very interesting that, that God entrusted these women with this message. And it's, it's so interesting to me as I was thinking about this this week and reading some different commentaries about how this is not something, if, if someone was going to invent this kind of story, this is not the way they would say the message was, was presented out there. It wouldn't make logical sense at that time that, that women would have been the bearers of such a message and such a testimony to come and proclaim. It just wouldn't have made any sense. Um, and I just, I just think that's so fascinating that uh, the fact the gospel writers included it um, and that you know, this is the way it was and that God entrusted this message to those who did not have the highest place in society. Um, and, and I think that's one thing we see Jesus do throughout his ministry is elevating the, the, the position of those who are lowly. So those who maybe are oppressed, we see him elevating the position of women, of children, of those who had um, different abilities. So someone who is blind or someone who is deaf he elevates um, their position, uh, this one with leprosy. And I love to see how that kind of plays out and that restoration happens even here and who is receiving the first message that Jesus is alive. And then we keep going here. And so the women leave the tomb area and as they're going, they hurried away. They were afraid, but yet they had, they were filled with great joy and were going to carry out the instructions that the angel had given them. And then suddenly Jesus uh, is with them. He met them. And I cannot even begin to fathom what that would be like. So they saw him die. They watched him be buried. They go and they hear he's alive and then to see him with their own eyes. And they clasp his feet and they fall down and worship him. And, and so we see them responding to this encounter with Jesus in worship and we also see this emphasis here as in clasping his feet. This was a bodily resurrection. Jesus wasn't some ghost or some apparition that you could like put your hand through or something. He was a real person that you could touch. Uh, he was resurrected and he met them there on their way to tell the disciples. He appeared to these women, not to the guards, to these women. And then he, he reinforces the angel's message of don't be afraid go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. So he um, doubles down in, on their instructions. And so we can assume um, that they continued on their way. And we know that from later in this passage that they did go and share that message. But I'm going to go ahead and read this next section um, about the guards report. So our curriculum leaves this part out, but I think it's fascinating. So I wanted to go ahead and read it. This is Matthew 28 verses 11 through 15. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So we see the guards do eventually wake up. They don't just lay by the tomb shaking and fainted forever. They wake up and they go into the city 
to report what had happened. Now, the consequences for a guard falling asleep while on guard duty would have probably been pretty severe, maybe even as severe as the death penalty. Um, but it, it definitely wouldn't have looked good for them to have fallen asleep and then for the body to not be there anymore. They, it meant that they didn't do their job. So we, we look back at Matthew 27 um, at the end, uh, 62 through 66. That is where the chief priests go to Pilate and they request a guard. They request guards to secure the tomb. Uh, to try to prevent anybody from taking Jesus' body. Now, grave robbing would have been carried a, a pretty hefty sentence. It was not. It was not condoned. It happened, um, and most of the time, the people who were robbing tombs would have been taking wealth and items that were in these tombs, not bodies. So it's just kind of interesting. They were. They wanted to prevent Jesus' body from being stolen. Um, and so Pilate gave them permission to have a guard. And so uh, were these Roman guards, were they temple guards? They were guards. We're not really given the specifics of which type of guards. But regardless of who these guys were, they did not uphold their guard duties to the best of their ability. In a, it, because they, they in, in, in essence, they failed. <laughs> they, they did not keep the body from disappearing. But we know why. Um, but so they go and the chief priests bribe them to tell a false story and they accept it. And I think it's so, it's so fascinating because these men who would have had, it's very ironic, actually, these men who would have been had, um, their, their version, their testimony would have carried a lot of respect and a lot of weight. They were guards. They were. Uh, men and their testimony would have carried a lot of respect, but their testimony was false. And the women who whose word was not to be trusted were the ones giving the true testimony. What a reversal! And I, it's just so fascinating. And Matthew puts that here because this is the story that was circulating when he wrote down the words here in in his gospel, and he wanted to put it, put out there why um, why this was a story that was circulating. All right, so he addresses that here. And so we see the guards, despite the dramatic display of the earthquake and the appearance of the angel of the Lord, they, they take the bribe and they spread a false story. And so that, that's what we have there. And so then we return back to the story, starting in verse 16, of, of Jesus and his disciples and his appearances. So let's go ahead and read these last few verses, and then we'll talk about them. So Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we see that the disciples are obedient. They hear the woman's message and they go to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. And it's in Galilee. So they go and meet Jesus up on a mountain. And it just made me think about all the times that God meets people on the mountain. Moses meets God on the mountain. We see uh, Elijah meeting God on the mountain. Jesus is transfigured up on the mountain. And mountains are important in scripture. And so here again... Jesus is meeting his disciples on the mountain and he goes and he's, he's there and they saw him and they respond in worship. And just like the women, they respond in worship. But then Matthew includes this detail, but some doubted. And I, it's very interesting to me because you have these people who have been following Jesus and seeing him resurrected with their own eyes, but some doubted. And I wondered a little bit about this word doubted and what it meant. And so I was reading in a commentary this week and the word that is used for doubt here can connote hesitation, not just, um, not really this outright unbelief, but more of like hesitating to believe. Uh, and so the commentary I was reading made the point that 
it's almost as if seeing this movement from unbelief and fear and and just all that they had gone through and to a place of faith and a place of joy. Um, maybe it wasn't quite instantaneous. Maybe it was a little bit hesitant. Uh, maybe it wasn't quite an instantaneous change. And I think that's kind of a somewhat comforting because I know it's not always easy for people to go from this place of unbelief to this place of belief. It's a process for a lot of people and that's okay. Um, doubt is, is okay to experience doubt. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to not, um, get it all, all figured out all in one moment. It's a process and it's, it's an unfolding process of understanding and of, of growing faith and growing understanding. And so Matthew includes this, with some doubted. So do we think that they doubted and were, didn't and turned away? Well, we're not told that. Um, and like I said, the word that they use there it includes this idea of hesitation. So this hesitation to just be completely all in. And I think a lot of us probably could relate to that. So then they, the, then Jesus is there and he says to them what we call the Great Commission. And one of the things I think is very interesting is if we look at these, the word all, as we look throughout this passage, he says, all authority has been given to him. He says, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything. So all the things that he's commanded them. And he's with them at all times for all the end of the age, all the way to the end of the age. So one of the things that this reminded me of was um, in Philippians 2, where we see the, what is often called the Christ hymn in Philippians 2. And we studied this uh, not too terribly long ago when we read through Paul's letter to the Philippians. Um, let me flip over there real quick. I wanted to look at part of that um, passage in Philippians 2. Because it starts at the beginning of it in uh, verse 6, and it talks about um, Jesus uh, humbling himself and becoming uh, coming um, to earth as a human and then humbling himself to death on a cross. But then the last part, starting in verse 9, talks about how God exalted him. So that you get this contrast between the humiliation and the ex exaltation at the end. Every this, uh, gave him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. So we get these absolutes of Jesus is the supreme. He is over all. And that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess. So this, this all... This idea of all, so all authority, all people, all nations, everyone, everything. And so it kind of is a very similar theme there. That's what I was making me think of, this universal authority, this universal um, Jesus for everyone, all nations. And so this idea that um, he is giving his followers this command to make disciples. Uh, but is he saying, I have all the authority. So the one who has all the authority is giving the authority to his followers to go and make other followers of Jesus. Um, so they are going to go knowing that Jesus is sovereign over everything in heaven and on earth. And one of the things I think is very particularly interesting is when you look at uh, this passage in the Greek. The, the imperative here is make disciples. Go, teaching, baptizing, those are all participles. So they're all the ing words. So it's going, baptizing, and teaching. Um, but the command is to make disciples. And I really like, as I was thinking about this, it's, it's this idea of like, as we're going, so therefore, going, while you're going, make disciples of all people. So yes, there is some sort of an imperative in the sense that we are to go and make disciples, but it's not just a go, only certain people are to go. It's that we're all to go. We're all to make disciples in whatever spheres we find ourselves. So some people that will like look like going to all the nations, but sometimes all the nations are right here in Corpus Christi, quite a few nations um, represented here. We're supposed to make disciples. We're supposed to uh, help other people follow Jesus, help other people come to understand and to obey and to, to hear and to understand and to obey and also become disciple makers and help people know what it means to follow Jesus, 
make disciples, make other followers. And Jesus doesn't give any qualifications um, for who they're supposed to make disciples. It's just all, all nations, all people. And then he tells them the promise that is one of my favorite parts of this whole verse, which is the last one. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So this Jesus who has all authority and who has just conquered death and who is giving them that command to go and make disciples is also promising to be with them, to be right there with them and, and every step of the way. He doesn't send us out alone. He's with us the whole time. So we don't have to worry about what to say or how to say it because he's with us and he's going to show us and he's um, going to uh, continue to be with us. So at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, we are told that um, the angel comes and tells Joseph, you're to call him Jesus, God with us. And his name will be Emmanuel, God with us. At the end, Jesus is still with us. Jesus is still God with us. Right here. He's with us even to the end of the age. And what a beautiful picture. A great way to uh, celebrate the resurrection of Jesus this Easter. Thank you for joining me today. Next week, we'll be back in First Thessalonians. So I'll see you then. Bye.